Who stole the microphone? Who stole the microphone? Oh, it's over here. Such a well-coordinated team. There we go. Boo! Good morning. We'd like to invite you to our second annual Trunk or Treat. Trunk or Treat will be held on Saturday, October 27th from 2 to 4 p.m. You can help by volunteering your time, donating extra treats, and by donating canned food for food share. The Girl Scouts have set a goal to collect 1,000 cans by Trunk or Treat. We want your help too. Please join us, the Girl Scouts and Food Share, in the spooktacular event. We can do this. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Now is your time. Oh my. Do you need assistance? No, I'm good. Come on up. Once upon a time, there was a boy named Ben, and he had two beautiful, perfect, sparkling, juicy apples. And as he was admiring them, his mom walked up and said, Oh, can I have one of those? And immediately Ben took a big bite out of both of them. His mom didn't show it on the outside, but on the inside, her heart kind of sank. But in the next second, Ben held out the red apple and said, here, you eat this one. It's much sweeter. You know, have you ever heard someone say, I think they're carrying around a lot of baggage, kind of like these. And they'd be happier if they didn't have all that baggage. Well, they don't mean clothes in there. They mean something more like someone was mean to you at recess in kindergarten, and in fifth grade, you're still upset about it, and you're still carrying it around with you. And I think some of us have baggage sunglasses. And they're glasses that we see through that we're kind of looking through all this yucky baggage we're carrying, and we're seeing through that instead of clearly and purely like you children. And by the way, thank you for being amazing teachers for all of us grown-ups. I think even Jesus' disciples had on baggage sunglasses sometimes. I think there's a photo where Jesus is with the children, but before the children came, the disciples were, they had been arguing about who was best. They weren't listening to Jesus teach. And then a different time, the kids wanted to see Jesus, and they said, no, back off. He needs to rest. Give him a break. And Jesus said, nope, let the children come unto me. I don't think Jesus wore baggage sunglasses. And I think that's another reason we get to come to church every Sunday, in addition to Lisa Katawaki's cookies. And that is to learn how to get rid of our baggage and our baggage sunglasses. How about we have a prayer and go to Sunday school? Awesome God, we give you thanks for this wonderful church where we come not only to learn about your unending love, but also to learn how to see the world through your loving, forgiving, and compassionate eyes. It is with grateful hearts we pray and we say together, amen. Uh, as many of you know, and if you don't, let's just say a quick word. A major initiative of this congregation in its mission ministries is to support our youth participating in Sierra Service Project. This is an ecumenical project that organizes teams of young people going out all across the Western states to make a difference in local communities and peoples in their, people in their homes. It's an experience for the kid, both of spirits, kids of both the practical skill, pounding nails and painting and doing stuff, as well as spiritual growth and getting to know one another. So our thanks to Christy as youth director for championing all of this and making it happen, Anna and the other adults uh, who have led and sp uh, been sponsors and hosts on these trips. And we're going to see some pictures and hear some stories today. 
Hi, I'm Anna Binney, and I want to personally thank everyone for their support of this program that we've had over many years. Uh, this year we took 26 total uh, students and adults on our trips. The middle school went directly to Smith, Smith River and worked there for a week. The high school team, as you'll hear later, we started off in Chiloquin and midweek had to make a move over to Smith River. Um, so we will hear what they have to say. Oh, my personal group, my team, my small group team, uh, we were supposed to be painting part of City Hall in Chiloquin, but then when we moved, uh, my new group was painting a church, a nearby church. Okay, um, I'm Lauren, and, and yes, Lauren. <laughs> yes, that is me. And in this picture, our goal was to draw a picture about what SSP meant to you. And so I just drew a picture of a little home with people and music and love and acceptance. My name is Luke Van Kiersbilk. This is my this was my fifth time at SSP. Uh, this will this is my last time as a camper. And this is a picture of me staining some boards for a uh, ramp in uh, Smith River. So after we made the move, we all had new jobs, and this was for my job. This was actually the day it was so smoky they wouldn't let us go out and work. So one of the work supervisors brought the work back to us. So the youth are staining boards at the site because we weren't allowed to go out to the work sites. And that's just a nice picture of our high school youth hanging out together. At SSP, everyone has a daily job. And one of the daily job is doing the dishes. Go dishes. Um, sometimes we make it fun. Um, Katie in my work group, she's not here today. Um, she had a brilliant idea of playing music through the speaker that's normally in the kitchen. We put it near the window and, we were, and all of the people in my work team, we were all singing along to all the songs from Guardians of the Galaxy and it was super, super fun. So we make our jobs fun. They're not always bad. Hi, I'm Mike. We worked on the ramp and we had a team that was absolutely fabulous. They all worked at the same time and did a great job. And one side note, is there were some other churches that had some people that were pulling some pranks and the people from this church were stars. They were outstanding and the, the staff up there recognized that and loved everyone from Camarillo for that. Hi, I'm Jill, and this is safety training, because most of us don't know how to use these machines, so they are nice enough to teach us. Uh, once we went to um, Smith River, um, back at Chiloquin, my work team, we were supposed to build a deck for this amazing woman who made really good Kool-Aid. Um, and then, but once we went to Smith River, um, my work team partnered with another work team, um, and we did pretty much two weeks' worth of work with that other work team in two days because we were all so willing to help and we almost finished it. So it was a strike team job the next week and all they had to do was um, put another pad of concrete and then it was done. And so it was really nice to help people. My name is Rachel. Um, this is a photo of my work team and I at a community garden. Um, Dar is the man who made it all happen. I don't know where he is in the photo. Oh, he's standing in the middle with the hat. Um, he really wanted to make a community garden um, for the Smith River community, and we had the pleasure um, of being able to help with that. We got to plant flowers um, around the fencing, around the garden. We moved a huge pile of dirt, um, which took a couple days. Um, and Megan and I actually got to paint a mural um, that's in the front of the garden and the entrance, and it says, um, wait, I'm sorry, what to say? Oh, oh, the places you'll grow. I always want to say, oh, the places you'll go because of Dr. Seuss, but it said, oh, the places you'll grow. All right, I'm honestly not sure which work team this is, but it looks like they're building yet another, okay, so... Yeah, <laughs> they, they had a really interesting time because they were given basically a pickaxe and a crowbar and told to dig holes in solid asphalt. It was honestly a bit ridiculous. 
Hi, I'm Erin, and this is us in the gym in Chiloquin on Tuesday when they wouldn't let us work. So we all hung out in there, and we were all patiently waiting, hoping to go do work. And while we were up there, they showed us a documentary about the Modoc War, which is a, I took US history last year, and the Modoc War is completely left out of history. And it's very important to that area of the country, and so it's really interesting to learn more about that. This, this is uh, my favorite picture. This is Mega Week Song Time. We had to leave Oregon because it was too smoky. The air quality was so bad we weren't allowed to stay outside and work. So we packed up the vans again and traveled to Smith River, California. And there was already a site at Smith River. There was already 60, 70 people there. So once you put the two groups together, this is what it looked like. This was our first day together. We were doing song time out at the river. And yeah, there's like 150 people there. And there's both, si both groups all together the last day. So this is a picture of the air quality and smoke that we had to, that we were in the first few days. So this is part of what made this week kind of challenging, is the air quality was very poor, and it was so poor that we couldn't go outside and work like we've been saying. So we really appreciated all the staff being patient and all the counselors being really helpful. So this was, it's, it made it interesting, but we were happy that we were able to go to Smith River and have a great rest of the week. Hi there, I'm Megan Ortkes. Um, so the picture that we have right now is um, the water day that we had um, on Wednesday once we moved to Smith River. Um, we got to get out of all of the smoke and we were able to have a beautiful day um, in the forest and by the water that we just showed and it was a really good time of reflection um, as we met another group of about 80 or 90 people. Um, and then the next one is, that is our spiritual, spiritual walk that we had on Thursday. Um, so around Thursday evening at about sunset, our um, staff members brought us to the beach in Smith River and um, we did a lot of reflection and meditation times and um, had, we shared, <clears throat> shared a couple stories um, and it was a really good time to kind of hear your own thoughts and worship truly. So this is when we have song time and everyone sings a song and there are some special dances to some of them. Uh, this was dinner time. There wasn't room for everyone to sit inside, um, but we enjoyed also sitting outside on the sidewalk. The next picture, I think, is um, the couple pictures there are examples of the evening program. After the youth work during the day, we come home, we have dinner. Then we always have some kind of evening program and, and some kind of cheer. There's always an SSP cheer. So I think in that first picture, they're doing the SSP cheer. And the second picture, they're doing site reports where you have to do a skit to act out what your work team did that day. And I think this year our team did it, you had to do it to a Disney tune, which made it kind of interesting. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, this was at the end of our spirit walk on Thursday night. And the spirit walk, what Megan said, was it's a very good time of reflection and like connection to God. And um, it was just... Really, it was a good time for quiet and a really great time for reflection. Hi, I'm Allie, and this is a picture of truly the most iconic moment from SSP this year. <laughs> this is Train Mountain. It's in Oregon. It is probably the most amazing place I've ever been. It's like a mini like train park, so you sit on these like just tiny trains, even though you're adult size, and you like ride around. And some of the work teams were supposed to work on it while we were in Oregon, but uh, because of the smoke, we didn't work. But they did allow us, everyone at SSP, to ride around. And it was really weird, but it was fantastic. <laughs> I would totally do it again. Hi, I'm Jack. I was part of the team that had originally went to Chiloquin, Oregon, and then moved to Smith River. In Chiloquin, my team worked on a ramp, and then when we moved to Smith River, we worked on a shed. Um, my name's Karina, and I'm in the middle school group, and I, we worked on a ramp. Hi, my name's Haley, and I was part of the middle school, I was part of the middle school group, 
and my group worked on a ramp as well. So I would just like to say on behalf of all of our youth, thank you to all of our wonderful counselors and to the congregation. We really appreciate all of your genera generosity and the cards that you send us, we really appreciate it. And this is a life-changing experience for many of our youth. And as a fifth year uh, graduate, I am very happy that I was able to do it. And I would especially like to thank the Paulsons for generously letting us use their condo in Chico when we were driving up. So thank you to the congregation and thank you to the church. We really appreciate it. Say great group. Thank you. We're in the midst of a lot of news, and I simply call, uh, call to mind and heart that we might remember all those who have experienced abuse of any kind, but particularly sexual abuse, uh, that we keep them in our prayers, and we pray for the honesty that is required to deal, that we might experience healing. I'm mindful with all these kids standing up here that parenting is a, a daunting, challenging, thrilling, creative, exciting frustrating job, and we might hold them in our prayers, especially as they try and interpret for our youth and their kids uh, how to live in this complex world. It ain't easy. For our prayer today, I want to offer to you a uh, reflection on the Beatitudes, um, written, uh, written by uh, one of our pastors, and simply receive this as our prayer, and then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Blessed are those whose spirit has been shaped by poverty, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are sick at heart to see power abused, for they shall be invited to the feast. Blessed are those who are not arrogant, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who are desperate for justice, for they shall eat and drink their fill. Blessed are the compassionate, for they shall have compassion shown to them when they need it. Blessed are those who refuse to be corrupted, for they shall not be afraid to come face to face with God. Blessed are those who take action to bring about peace, for they shall truly be called God's own. Blessed are those who carry wounds suffered in the struggle for justice, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. O oh, gracious God, we pray for these blessings, for ourselves and for one another, for those known and unknown. We pray in the name of the one who came to us unknown and was your blessing incarnate transforming all things from then until now. In his name we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm to the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. Fullness of God in 
righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on the cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I lay Many will recognize Jesus' words in Matthew where he says, Let the little children come unto me. Less familiar is the original version in Mark and why he says that to his disciples. Here it is in the context of his traveling, teaching and healing from Mark chapter 9. After accomplishing another healing, Jesus and the disciples went on through the region of Galilee. They came to the village of Capernaum. When they arrived at the house where they would stay and were settling in, Jesus interrupted them saying, what were you discussing on the road? Their silence was deafening because they had been arguing with one another over who among them was the greatest. Immediately he sat down and summoned the 12 to gather around. So you want first place above all then take last place of all, and be the servant of all. Then Jesus called a child into the middle of the room, and folding the little one into his arms, he said, Whoever embraces one of these children as I do, embraces me, and far more than me, the one who sent me. The word of God for the people of God. It's interesting that popular entertainment uh, has become one of the places where deep philosophical questions are addressed. And one of the most popular movies in the last year has been Wonder Woman. I know we have already talked about it, but I found there's yet more that might inform our understanding, uh, and particularly uh, in this issue today that we're going to talk about. Now, the scene we're going to see is near the end, uh, where... Uh, Wonder Woman, Princess Diana, you know, she's a demigod, and her mission is to save humanity from itself, literally. And so they're in the midst of World War I, and she's finally seen the horrors of what human beings do to each other. And she's arguing with Captain Steve Trevor, who's going to be her love interest, about 
the fact that she thinks she has killed Ares, the god of war, and yet people are still fighting. How can this be? We need to stop the gas. Come on. No, all of this should have stopped. Diana, the fighting should have stopped. We don't have time. To talk Why about are they this doing? One. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, Ares I is know dead. That you, I, they can stop fighting now. I, Why are they still because fighting? Maybe that's because maybe, uh, maybe it's them. Maybe. Maybe people aren't always good. Aries or no Aries, maybe it, it's just, it's who they are. Diana, no. Diana, we can talk about this later. No. I need you to come with no, me. No, after everything I saw, it can't be, it cannot be. They were killing each other, killing people they cannot see, children, children. This is at the heart of the movie. Are people good or bad? What is the real nature of humankind? In theological and church terms, we talk about it as uh, original sin. And yet we have a sense that, uh, but of course people are, you know, fundamentally good, aren't they? That's behind the movie, and it's behind what I think is in the middle of this story today. And so I want to talk about why is it that we think people are good, that human beings are good, when there's so much evidence to the contrary? Why do we think that? Are we good or bad? And what are we going to do about that, one way or the other? It goes yet again to, uh, that's why I've dragged my gnarly root out here, going to the root and trying to find that one thing that makes the difference in everything. Like Connie was talking about the sunglasses, the baggage glasses. What are the lenses through which we see ourselves that we see humanity and how do we understand that and then good or bad or both what are we going to do about it would you pray with me gracious God move in our hearts and minds today to be open to your word to the testimony of Christ that we might see in a new way the message that has come to us down through the centuries so that we might make it real today in his name we pray Amen. This story about Jesus bringing a child in is echoed in the other Gospels, as we mentioned. The imagery of Jesus with children is, is always appealing. How could it not be? Particularly Hart's translation of this particular lesson where he talks about, where he uses the phrase that Jesus folds the child in his arms. Very in intimate imagery. Just kind of makes you want to go, oh, of course. But have you ever held a baby? Yeah. Our own uh, Bishop Hagia told the story just recently that uh, for the first time he had a granddaughter and he had his first instance of holding the baby in his arms. And he had come from teaching at the seminary, a class of seminarians, about original sin and John Wesley's doctrine of the utter depravity of human beings. And so it was in his mind as might well be in ours. How can, how can that notion of utter depravity, of original sin, how does that jibe with, with this baby when you're holding it in your arms? The child must be innocent, must be a clean slate, a tabula rasa, original sin. Just, it didn't make sense. <laughs> and then he reported all of a sudden, his charmingly beautiful baby granddaughter began screaming its head off because it was hungry and other things were happening, as happens with babies. And so he's, he shared his own realization. A child is the perfect embodiment of selfishness and manipulation. It will do anything and everything to get what it wants, starting with food, number one. And yet we imagine that we start pure and good and clean, etc. Where do we get this idea that the human being is essentially, naturally good? A few weeks ago, we talked about, uh, we did a 2,000 years of history in two minutes, and I'm going to touch on that just briefly again. The root of that idea, the root of the idea of human goodness is in the Enlightenment. 
the last 500 years of our thinking about, one, uh, about the world. The pillars of the Enlightenment, just to check them off very quickly for you, is the uh, triumph of reason, uh, that science rules and has the answer for everything. All hail Isaac Newton. It's his science and understanding that drives much of the world today and enabled us to put a man on the moon and develop cancer treatments and do all the good things that science can do. That is the chief characteristic of the Enlightenment, the triumph of reason. Secondly, the, uh, and this is where it comes in, the essential goodness of humanity. Now, this was a direct response direct response to the many centuries before then in which the church asserted original sin, made the case for us human beings are just naturally crummy, or as Wesley put it, uh, that we are victims of utter depravity. And so in the Enlightenment, it shift to the other side. No, we're not utterly depraved. We are utterly, ultimately good. That's where that idea comes from. The third pillar of the Enlightenment was the doctrine of progress, that um, before then the idea was rooted literally in the agricultural world and the seasons, and that time and our, the human experience is simply an endlessly repeating cycle over and over and over again. And the way to make sense of the world was to adapt to the, that unending cycle. What science opened up uh, and planted within the, uh, within the notion of the Enlightenment was that it's not an endless cycle, it's a staircase that humanity is ever progressing upwards and improving. So reason, goodness, and progress, there are three pillars of the Enlightenment. However, uh, and we come to the post-Enlightenment, post-modern era, where we have seen those pillars shaken and the promises of science and goodness and progress broken. How? Reason. Science and reason answers many things we now know, but not everything. Not everything. To claim the quote from Einstein one more time, not everything that counts can be counted. Not everything that counts can be counted. The counting is the science part, right? But what counts is more than what we can add up. The fact that both of those are true, we understand both are true, reflects they are, both, they are both real, and one is not exclusive of the other. You see this debate now and then, and indeed one of the first fall forms that we did when I came here was a supposed debate about science versus faith, science versus religion, as if it's one or the other, but that's not the case. And the only reason it gets framed that way is again rooted in the Enlightenment because the category of thinking is always either or. That's the only way the, the Enlightenment knows, the science, scientific mind knows how to judge things and count things, is it's one thing or the other. It's black or it's white. So to frame that question means you're always, you're always wrong if you're on which, one side or the other. And that's still where we are in very large part in our political climate right now. Instead, we know that physics, through uh, subsequent work of Einstein and everybody else, we know that Newton's apple is real and Schrodinger's cat is real. So both Newtonian physics and um, quantum physics, both are real. Both are necessary to be able to articulate the truth of reality. So it's not about science and faith supplanting or replacing one another, but rather a both and. That's the hallmark of the postmodern era. They are not contradictory, but complementary. And indeed, we live in that intersection of the sacred and the secular. That's what the cross is all about, that it's both, not one or the other. So science has its uh, both and. It's both reason and faith. And for the human good, let's see if we can get that one up here, it's both. Scholars point to World War II and specifically the Holocaust as our collective experience of turning away from the Enlightenment assumption that humans are essentially good because there we saw the fullness and the depth of real evil, and it was at our own hands. Further and later examples abound. Take your pick from the 21st century genocides in Cambodia, Armenia, Rwanda, Darfur, Bosnia, 
and today with the Rohingya. And those are just the intentional ones. It doesn't count our failures to respond to famine, disaster, the refugee crises, much less the ongoing and emerging awareness of just how deep and destructive our prejudices are, starting certainly with racism. And now we are beginning to see the depths of misogyny. So humanity, good and bad, good and bad. Last one, progress very quickly. Uh, don't have a lot of time to go into it other than to say one of the uh, findings uh, in the contemporary area is that solving one thing generates a new level of problems. Think of it in these terms, back at the turn of the last century, a real problem in urban cities was everything was moved around by horses. People traveled by horses, moved, uh, you know, um, moved stuff by horses. So there was a tremendous volume of road apples. And how do you get rid of that on a regular basis? Because it wasn't just an inconvenience. It wasn't just mucking up your shoes. It was a severe health hazard. So the advantage and the bonus of the invention of the car was not just, oh, it's faster, but also that it was cleaner. But now we understand it has given us something much more dirty to deal with and how it's affecting our climate. So all three of those together, reason and faith, human good and bad, progress and problems. What does this mean in the struggle to understand humankind and what are we supposed to do about all of that? How do we find the balance between optimism, pessimism, cynicism, and realism? I would confess to you that my spiritual apocalypse, which is to say my come to Jesus moment of revelation and personal transformation on the Lakeshore church camp many years ago was of God's amazing grace and overwhelming love. That said, it was in the context of being raised within the church's deep culture of judgment, which is rooted in the doctrine of original sin, which I still do not believe in its traditional definition. So since the day of that transformation for me, I have been preaching and hopefully practicing grace, compassion, and justice ever since. But since then, I have also become convinced that sin is real, and the collective sin that we call evil is very real. It must be accounted for, and it must be countered but countered in a spirit of love and justice, else love cannot win and the kingdom will not come. So, again, how are we supposed to understand this story, especially this child whom Jesus embraces as the icon of discipleship, of what we're supposed to be like and what we're supposed to do, and what does that mean for the struggle between good and evil, between sin and grace? The story's context is the disciples bickering about who's first, who's the greatest. One of the other versions is it's about who gets to sit at Jesus' hand when they get to heaven. In other words, it is selfishness at a grown-up level. And I think that's a, a starting definition for sin. Sin is selfishness perfected by experience. It's like a well-aged wine, but it's toxic to drink. Selfishness in a child is to be expected, annoying and messy though it is. But when that selfishness is allowed to flourish into adulthood, when it takes on the skills and capacity of adulthood, when it is allowed to fester and take on power, when it discovers that it can collaborate with others to maximize its selfishness, elevating greed to the co collective and corporate level and systematizing it, institutionalizing it, then we have a problem. And it's not just a personal problem, but a communal, collective, global problem. Indeed, an interlocking, self-reinforcing system that is destructive not to just some unfortunate minorities, who are actually the numerical majority, 
but a problem that has become an assault upon the human spirit and human condition, and therefore an affront to God. This is where the broken promise of inevitable progress comes in. As Reinhold Niebuhr has said, thank you, Gene, for tracking this down. Every heightened potency of human existence also represents a possibility of evil. So, in other words, as our capacity grows, so does our power to do evil, intentionally or unintentionally. Here, then, is a different understanding of sin. We are born good and selfish. But when selfishness is elevated and weaponized to break our connection with our neighbor and with God in order to get me what I want, what we want at the expense of others, at the oppression of others, including even their demise, then that, that, is sin. So when the disciples confess their adult onset selfishness, Jesus knows he's got to jump in quickly. These are his disciples. He's got to deal with their selfishness. That can't be a part of who you're going to be if you're going to follow Jesus. So he counters it first by simply inverting their words. Lovely word play there. You want to be first? Be last. You want other people to serve you? Serve others. That's what true greatness is. But he knows, you know, his experience with the disciples is that they're not really quick. He knows it's not enough. And so he moves to a visual and tangible teaching. He, he tags a child into the game and physically demonstrates, embrace this. Embrace this. What does this child have that we want? And more importantly, what we need. First of all, a child has a child's mind. And by that I mean an empty, open mind. It is what in the Zen tradition is called the beginner's mind. In other words, empty yourself of the assumptions, including that enlightenment notion that we are purely good. Let go of that one if you're going to deal in a real way with the issues before us. Next, in place of your hubris and pride and selfishness, embrace humility. Get over yourself. And open yourself to connect with God and neighbor. And by opening yourself, just as our kids were led into doing in their exercises and programs at SSP, by opening yourself, make yourself vulnerable, embracing one another, for you are embracing Christ and God who is in Christ. For that's the message of the gospel. God's own humility is revealed in Christ and abides with us in Christ. Divinity took on vulnerability, ultimate vulnerability, to experience this common mortality. God places the divine self in our arms even as every child begins in our arms. So how shall we respond to this opportunity, this, this responsibility to embrace God in one another? The answer is in what every child already has, not just an open mind, but an open heart. An open heart. In the climax of the Wonder Woman story, Diana is challenged to seize the opportunity to solve this dilemma of humanity's goodness and evilness, but particularly its evilness, its persistent cruelty towards one another, and that's represented by Dr. Maru, this character, one of the bad guys, bad gals. Dr. Maru is an evil scientist working for the Nazis. No, she's also known as Dr. Poison. In a key element of the storytelling throughout the movie, we see her wearing this partial mask on her face. In an interview with the Spanish actress who plays the doctor, Elena Anaya, she said, it was very tricky for me to take on the evil of this character. Dr. Maru enjoys people's pain. She's creating 
terrible weapons, and her purpose in life is to kill as many people as possible and provoke as much pain as possible. When you're responsible for playing a character like this, you think, well, how is it possible that someone invented a character this evil? And then, unfortunately, I realize that more than ever, there are evil people in real life. They are on television. They're very powerful people. And they don't wear masks like Dr. Maru wears. These people are villains in real life, hurting a lot of people. They're doing a lot of damage to humankind. So that's one answer. In the climactic scene of Wonder Woman, she has the opportunity to destroy Dr. Maru and the evil of humanity that she represents. And so she is portrayed standing there poised, holding this giant army tank overhead, ready to crush the poison that is in humanity. And amidst the winds of destruction that are swirling around them, suddenly it rips off the mask covering Dr. Maru's face. And we see the ugly wound that has marked her, making her human. And we are reminded that hurt people hurt people. When we are wounded, it taps into our natural selfishness and defensiveness, and we hurt back. They deserve what we have received, or that's the mortal way to think about it. And indeed, they deserve what, they are, what we try to give back. And Diana is encouraged to act in that way. She's challenged to destroy Dr. Evil, but she glimpses there. What she glimpses in that moment is not entirely evil, but instead woundedness, vulnerability, the original child. Can she embrace that? Can we? Diana recalls the captain's confession of love for her, Love, a relationship of ultimate vulnerability to one another. And she realizes, yes, Dr. Morrow has sinned, but destroying her will not redeem her or stop her or solve anything. It will only perpetuate the violence. So her choice is the gospel choice. What would Jesus do to break the cycle of retributive justice? That is the story of Easter. That is the story of the gospel. And to the challenge that Dr. Maru deserves her fate, which in scriptural terms, you'll remember, the wages of sin are death. Paul writes that, by the way, not Jesus. To the challenge that Dr. Maru deserves her fate, Diana says, it's not about what you deserve. It's about what you believe. And I believe in love. In the face of the truth that there is, there is sin and evil in this world, and it has its roots in us, Jesus says, embrace this, God is love, first, last, and always. What do you believe in? Thanks again to Mark for playing and singing.
Frank for reading. For all our media crew, we have coffee and refreshments over in the patio. You're welcome to join in, as well as the discussion groups following immediately after Brooks and Howell Parler. Now may you go in peace and receive the peace of Christ only to spread and share it, embracing all those you meet. Find the Christ within. Amen. Thank you.